Greetings, everyone. My name is Lori Bambaco. I'm an oncology dietitian, and I am presenting to you live from inside Cancer Wellness Center. And this is the next installment of Ask the Dietitian. So for this program, what we do is we give me a measly 30 minutes to answer all of your great questions about diet and cancer and nutrition. Now, being that this month is February, it's American Heart Month, we thought we would shift our focus on what is also helpful for cancer survivors to protect their heart health. So the questions that were submitted are all related to the, that concept. What can we do food-wise, nutrition-wise, to help protect our heart even as a cancer survivor? So what I have are some show and tell items here, but also a handful of questions that were submitted, so I'm gonna get started right away. Okay, so the first question, I'm gonna hold it up for everyone to read. Why is the heart so vulnerable after cancer and after cancer treatment? Great question. Well, did you know that there are some survivors who are at risk for cardiovascular disease? So the best way to find that out for yourself is to talk to your healthcare team, especially your medical oncologist, to see about your specific certain circumstances and situation. Based on your diagnosis, based on your treatment plan, are you at increased risk for cardiovascular disease? And are there any necessary medical interventions that need to be done for you? Now, I'm just going to briefly overview the intersection of cardiology and oncology. The two are actually related. And there's a new emerging field out there called cardio-oncology. Wow, fancy, right? So here's what happens when we get older, it's natural. Like the aging process puts us at risk for cardiovascular disease. So if it's been a year or a couple years that you've been diagnosed, that natural aging process right there, that alone may put you at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But what we do see from the research is that those people that are over 65 and have been diagnosed with cancer, they are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease when we compare them to someone at the same age who didn't have cancer in their history. So keep that in mind. Now, what happens? What might explain that? Well, there's a couple different mechanisms at play. There are the direct consequences of cancer and cancer treatment. So some chemotherapies, including anthrocyclines, so like doxorubicin, this can put someone at increased risk for ischemic heart disease. And that is a type of chemotherapy that is often used for breast cancer and other types of leukemia and lymphomas. Also, if you've had radiation to your chest region, what happens is there might be some artifacts that affect the heart. And so that alone is also a direct consequence of cancer treatment that may place someone at risk for ischemic heart disease. Then there's the indirect consequences. So many survivors report back to us that when they're diagnosed and they're undergoing treatment, they change their lifestyle, right? So maybe you can relate to this. You were exhausted because of treatment. Maybe you had surgery, so you were forced to become less active. So many people become a lot less active, a little more sedentary, just because of the cancer and the diagnosis and the treatment. A lot of people change what they eat. Naturally, it happens, right? Maybe they're not feeling like themselves on cancer treatment and they resort to eating some of the foods that they wish they didn't want to eat at that time. So what happens is many survivors can become deconditioned and there is a subset of the population of survivors that actually gain weight as a result of cancer and their treatment. And that's exactly why I co-facilitate a program called Weight Loss for Wellness at Cancer Wellness Center, because we find that there is a special unique crowd that needs more attention and needs more focus to help them get back on their feet and recover, regain some of that strength and that energy and vitality in pursuit of wellness and a little bit of weight loss. So the good news is, good segue to the next question, what is the most important help we can do to protect ourselves, right? So maybe you're finding that that's you, that you're at increased risk for heart disease. Maybe as a survivor, you've noticed you might have gained a little bit of weight. You're not moving as much as you once did or eating the same way. 
here's the good news. There are definitely approaches to take. And that's my job to help you understand that. So what's really nice is that the very same foods that one would eat to help protect them against cancer or a cancer recurrence are the same foods that you would also consume to protect and preserve your heart health. Win-win, right? So guess what foods those are? I have a good feeling most of you are gonna know. So it's the dietitian's favorite recommendation to pursue a plant-based eating style. So what do I mean when I say plant-based? Because you'll see it's very popular right now. And depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different explanation of what plant-based really means. And a dietitian, if you consult with me, I can tell you specifically what makes the most sense for you. But in general, plant-based means that when you plan your meals, they will consist mostly of plant foods. So that means your whole grains, your nuts and seeds, your beans and lentils, lots of veggies, including the starchy ones like a sweet potato, and the non-starchy ones, all those vibrantly colored vegetables, and then also fruit, plant-based. So most of your meals, most of your snacks, if they can be consisting of those foods, you're off and running. You're consuming a plant-based diet. Now, what's so great about a plant-based diet is that it's packed with nutrition. So it's really the superior way of eating. You're going to get the most bang for your buck out of your food choices. You get a high amount of antioxidants. You also get a high amount of phytochemicals. And all of those natural compounds actually protect us. They lower inflammation. They help control our blood sugar levels. And this all matters for cancer protection as well as keeping our heart healthy. So what I whipped up is I assembled a little something from last night's dinner. All right, so I got some leftovers here to try to demonstrate what a plant-based meal would look like. So I had some spaghetti squash and I cut it in half. I scooped out the seeds and I roasted it in the oven. And then I took that spaghetti squash and I used my fork to just create some little spaghetti squash noodles. So sort of like a nice substitution for pasta. But I wanted to stuff it. So I added some more vegetables inside and then I wanted to make it really satisfying and filling. So I wanted to add a protein but it didn't add just any protein. I decided to go with a plant protein. And one of my favorites is tofu. So I had some baked tofu left over. I threw that right inside there too. And this is a plant-based meal. Now it needs a little bit of flavor, right? It needs a little something on the side too. So I had some bulgur that I soaked in water and lemon and voila. Now I have a nice whole grain on the side and I used something that was left in the fridge at Cancer Wellness Center that's still really good. It's a nice little bottle of Harissa. So these, this nice flavor I'm gonna use on top of my spaghetti squash boat. And voila, I have a plant-based meal. So I'm gonna just hold it up for you to see, and I'm gonna enjoy this after we wrap today. But that's a plant-based meal. And really you can see how it really fits the bill, right? We're just adding lots of plant foods and customizing a plate that way, again, satisfies those conditions of eating a plant-based diet. Other examples I mentioned earlier, like whole grain. I have some farro here. I always like to show, show what we got in the kitchen here. This is absolutely delicious. You can batch cook this and freeze it and then pull it out and use it as a side or reheat it. Add whatever vegetables you have on hand, a nice flavorful sauce like the harissa, or maybe you have some hummus or some tahini, you can whip that together with some lemon juice and garlic and voila, you're again off and running with this delicious plant-based way of eating. I love my oats, so sometimes I'll have oats in the morning. And a way to make that even better plant-based wise is to add some fruit. So we have some frozen blueberries here and I love to put them in with some almond butter in my oats in the morning and that's a plant-based breakfast. Now, what about our next question? Do you have any plant-based cooking suggestions? Do I have any plant-based cooking suggestions? Come on, I need more difficult questions, please. I'm just kidding. All right, so yes, of course I do. And the sky's the limit. So I think whatever, if you come across something that looks interesting to you, go for it. Go for it because you want to suit your style. You want to make this pursuit of plant-based eating fun.
fun, right? And so that's going to be different things for different people. We had a great program last night with a vegan chef from downtown. We can check out the website. She's phenomenal. She's a vegan chef and she makes cooking fun. All right. So, and that's what we want to do. So that's chef Katie Simmons and she has a great website called plants rule. And I tend to agree. Um, and she's got a lot of great ideas. I also personally happen to like um, a dietitian called plant powered dietitian. And she came out with a new cookbook called the California vegan. Um, and it looks phenomenal. So it's hot off the press, something worth your attention. My personal cooking style is I like a lot of visuals. So I happen to like America's Test Kitchen and their line of cookbooks. And they have a cookbook called Plant-Based Cookbook, America's Test Kitchen Plant-Based Cookbook. It's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, but lots of fun ideas there. And again, those visuals are certainly something that inspire me. Um, another wonderful resource is uh, Meatless Monday. So look, look up Meatless Monday. It's this amazing campaign that has a lot of different extensions, but they started with Meatless Monday. And the concept is that could one day of the week for one meal, maybe Monday night, could you dedicate that meal to be meatless? Love that idea. So they have this amazing resource, tons and tons of different recipes that you can filter and find one that works for you. Now, what I love about the idea of transitioning to plant-based eating is that you might want to start slow. So you might want to start with just a meatless Monday meal and then next week do a meatless Monday and meatless Friday, you know? And then what you're doing is you're really making gradual changes towards plant-based eating. And that's really the name of the game. Now, what I wanna go back to are fats, right? Because a lot of people ask me, which fats do I use? And certainly there are some that are healthier than others in both worlds, in both, both cancer care, as well as cardiovascular disease care. So one of the questions that was asked, another good one, should I use, when, I, when should I use grapeseed versus avocado versus extra virgin olive oil? And what about canola oil? Isn't it too processed? Whew, what a good question. Okay, so <laughs> here's my takeaway. When you can use extra virgin olive oil, use it. And don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to bake with it. Don't be afraid to saute with it. It's known to have a moderate smoke point, but most of the cooking that we do in the kitchen is not gonna reach the smoke point that's gonna damage olive oil, okay? So the olive oil I like to reference, I'm gonna actually show the brand. Um, I don't get any uh, payment for endorsing this brand, uh, but this is a wonderful product that you'll find in most grocery stores. So it's California Olive Ranch. And the reason why I endorse this particular product is for this very special section on the back. So hopefully you can see it there. There's a harvest date on the back. So when we're looking for an olive oil, we want a pure and fresh olive oil. And that's what this can guarantee. Most other oils on the market, we have no idea no idea how long they've been sitting there, when they were pressed, and that matters highly for the nutritional content, okay? So when we pour this olive oil out, it's gonna have this beautiful green hue, and also it has some cloudiness to it. And that's because this has been cold pressed, and it's actually the first press. So think of olive oil, I like to describe it like literally like olive juice. It's like they took the olives and they just pressed out the juice. That's what we want to use when we're cooking. And what we've discovered about olive oil is that all of its constituents, the polyphenols, the vitamin E, that they protect the oil. So even when we cook it at 350 degrees or even sometimes higher, it protects the oil so that the oil doesn't go rancid. So this is a perfect example of a plant that has synergy because of all of the compounds that are in it. They exert this protective property so that we can use it in more ways than one. So that's my go-to in terms of using any oil in cooking, 
go for that extra virgin olive oil. Look for a quality brand and also protect it. You know, you, you've invested in it. So we're gonna keep, keep this safe from the elements, okay? We're not gonna leave this on the windowsill where it can get exposed to light. We're gonna make sure we squeeze this cap tight because we don't want any air inside that will help facilitate oxidation of the oil. And keep it, keep it safe in the cupboard, right? Keep it in your pantry. We don't want it exposed to heat, to light, or oxygen. That's gonna start to degrade the oil. We lose those precious compounds that are otherwise protecting it. Now with our other oils, you know, there's so many to choose from. They're all relatively good. They're all okay to try, all right? So things like walnut oil, flaxseed oil, we might want to use them in a dressing because they have a very low smoke point and they oxidize rather quickly. So let's not cook with those two oils, but great choices. Sesame oil has great flavor. So you put a little bit of that in a, in a stir fry, it's delicious and healthful. Same goes for canola oil. Canola oil's properties are very similar to olive oil, but here's the thing with canola oil. Most of what's in it is, is refined out. So most canola oil on the market has been refined. So not, not dangerous for us to have, but just not special like the olive oil is, okay? And same goes for grapeseed oil. Avocado oil is something we have in the kitchen here too. They're all great for us to use for different reasons. I wouldn't worry about the smoke point. I would worry more about how you keep your oil fresh. It's the freshness that seems to matter in terms of it being able to exert healthful properties when we use it. Okay, I'm gonna keep on going. Other fats in the diet that are healthy for us, nuts and seeds, right? So I mentioned like walnut oil, love to use walnuts, right? That in the oatmeal would be great as well. Love to snack on nuts. Pistachio nuts I often bring up for people because they're melatonin content, right? So they are helpful in inducing a state of relaxation, which is kind of nice this time of year too. Um, but melatonin has cancer protective properties as well. So pistachio nuts are a great choice. When we're using our oils, like I mentioned, we want to keep them safe. So we want to keep them out of light, out of the heat, and away from uh, air or oxygen. We do want to try to cut back on red meat and processed meat. So that's important for both heart health and cancer protective qualities, right? So red meat, like beef and any other form of red meat, it tends to carry a lot of saturated fats. So if we're talking about fats, the saturated ones are less desired for us to have in our body. If we consume too much of them over a long period of time, they can create a low level of inflammation in our body. And inflammation over a long period of time is what is associated with types of chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and like some types of cancers. So we want to make some substitutions if we can. You know, I mentioned earlier having tofu um, in my spaghetti squash. That's a great substitute for something like red ground beef or um, some other form of red meat. You know, if you wanted to use ground turkey or ground chicken, that would be an, a better alternative to ground beef. Um, things like uh, bacon, hot dogs, um, other, other types of processed meats like deli meat. Those are all processed. They're in the processed meat family. And the experts want us to limit them as much as possible because there's really no redeeming qualities regarding nutrition to processed meat. So we want to try to minimize them as much as possible. And again, making substitutions. So I have some really fun ideas to use tofu and tempeh as a way to give interesting flavor because they're kind of a blank slate but they are packed with nutrition packed you get fiber you get cancer fighters you get tons of vitamins and minerals that work like antioxidants but they don't bring with it the kind of the the negative storm of components that would otherwise create inflammation in the body from processed meat processed meat just has a lot of salt it has a lot of animal protein also animal iron and the way that it's processed, usually all of those components together are what wreak havoc on our body. 
So if we can minimize that, better off we are. So we also want to think about, I mentioned salt, we want to think about cutting back on salt. And uh, what I created for today's handout, I'm going to share with all of you that registered. There's some great recipes that we can customize and design our own blend, our own seasoning blend without salt. And we're going to add a ton of flavor by doing that. So what we want to pay attention to with our herbs and spices is, well, we want to recognize that, yes, they give us flavor, but they also give us great nutrition at the same time. Remember, most of our spices and our herbs historically were used for medicine. And so they still are relevant for us today um, and offer some help in terms of heart health and cancer health. So the other question that I got. Ready for this one? It's a mouthful. <laughs> okay, so I've read niacin is good to lower cholesterol, but too much can be dangerous. I'm reading this backwards, so hang on. Bear with me. <laughs> what foods contain niacin? I thought this was a great question, and, and because I specialize in oncology, I had to do a little bit of homework in order to respect give a best response to this. So niacin is the B vitamin, but you know what? Actually, before I get into the explanation of the answer for this one, I just wanna share with you all two of the things that I find I say most often when I'm working with an individual or if I'm presenting in a program. One of the things I say most often is, no single food or nutrient alone will, will protect us or will threaten us with regard to our health and risk of disease, okay? No single thing. It's a combination of all of the things that we eat in a pattern. That's what matters most, and we always wanna keep that in mind, okay? The second thing I find myself saying as a dietitian is we wanna rely on food first and supplements second for nutrition, okay? There are some circumstances and some exceptions to that rule, and again, that's where consulting with a dietitian and with your healthcare team can give you the best guidance for that. But let's go back to niacin, okay? So niacin is a B vitamin for those of you that are unfamiliar with niacin. And it has responsibilities in our body. So we, we have to eat niacin. One of its responsibilities is to unlock the energy when we metabolize carbohydrates. So you probably have heard this about B vitamins, like B vitamins give us energy, right? You might've heard that. They don't really give us energy, but they're a catalyst in the, in the equation that help unlock energy from the foods we eat, but specifically carbohydrates. Niacin also has a pretty important role for maintaining the integrity of cells. So if cells are becoming damaged, niacin has a responsibility to make sure it it doesn't uh, wreak havoc on our body from that damage. Now, where do we find niacin? Niacin is in a lot of animal foods. So chicken and turkey and salmon, those are some of our best food sources of niacin. But because we wanna try to pursue plant-based eating as much as possible, it's important that I share with you some plant sources of niacin. And that's our brown rice, peanuts, and the humble potato. So often I find myself defending potatoes. <laughs> they really are a great package, so don't be afraid of your potatoes. So now here's what we've learned about niacin. Um, yes, there actually is a prescription form of niacin that if, again, if a physician felt it was necessary for you, uh, he or she would prescribe it for you. So it's a conversation to have with a physician. Uh, what we fa have found in the research is that a large dose of niacin and they give it in a special form called nicotinic acid, and that's the prescription form. This has been shown to lower bad cholesterol. Now, here's the thing. Even though it lowers bad cholesterol, they haven't really found in the end that that made a difference for someone's heart health, right? So it might not have necessarily in the end led to um, lower risk for a heart attack, lower risk of a stroke. So the niacin might have lowered the bad cholesterol, but that's as far as it went, okay? Now, here's the thing. Nicotinic acid in a large dose, yes, whoever wrote, submitted that question is savvy. It can cause side effects. So as little as 30 milligrams 
of nicotinic acid can create kind of a flushing effect. So it can cause um, on your, your skin, like so your face, your arms, it can cause um, a burning and a tingling sensation. Some people even report getting itchy. Um, that can lead to some headaches, some rashes, some dizziness, all something we want to avoid if we can help it, right? So we want to be careful about just randomly deciding to take a supplement, including something like niacin. Now, if we eat niacin in the food forms, completely safe, completely safe. It will never cause that side effect. Now, large, large doses of nicotinic acid are dangerous, and they have been found to cause um, liver problems for those people that are taking a thousand milligrams or more. So just a word of caution from this oncology dietitian that if you're looking to protect your heart, I would suggest that you first talk to your physician and not just necessarily think that taking niacin is going to help. Remember what I shared. It's all of the things that we do in a pattern of eating that really are associated with keeping us healthy, right? So separate from niacin, if we pursue a plant-based diet, if we cut back on salt, if we make some substitutions like I shared, that's associated with reducing the risk for some types of cancer, and it's also associated with reducing risk for cardiovascular events. So keep that in mind, right, and think about food first, supplement second, especially from our plant friends and in pursuit of a plant-based diet. So I see we have a few minutes left. We're gonna let any participants, after we stop recording, if any participants wanna ask additional questions.